Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for that kind introduction and the, a little bit of that backstory to the uh, book that was mentioned, the biblical ethics book, uh, Robertson McQuilkin. Actually, Robertson McQuilkin was president of Columbia International University where I attended and he was teaching the class on biblical ethics and before it became a published book, it was just like a, you know, kind of a, a, a manual uh, that we used, you know, kind of the text for our biblical ethics class and then eventually it got published and then as he was getting older and wanted to update it, he asked if uh, someone could enter in to bring it into a third edition and uh, update it and so forth. So I was glad actually for the opportunity to step in and be uh, a co-author with someone who had been a mentor and an influence in my life. So I trust that this will be a, a blessing to you all. Uh, teach at Palm Beach Atlantic University if any of you want to study philosophy with us and how philosophy as a tool can make an impact in our culture, uh, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to say a few words about the topic of truth. We live in a true for you but not for me kind of society. We see uh, bumper stickers saying tolerance and coexist. And I've written a book specifically on the topic of uh, relativism and pluralism and the uniqueness of Christ in that kind of a world. But we see on the headlines people like Oprah telling us that we need to speak your truth uh, you know, into society. Your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. I, I thought it was just truth. Is it, you know, but when you read this, it looks like just a matter of opinion. This is my perspective and you need to hear my perspective. Well, what's the big deal if it's just your truth and not the truth? There is a six-year-old Dutchman who wanted his birth certificate changed because he felt 40 years old instead. So thankfully the judge said, no, you can't do that. You've got to live in the real world. And so he, uh, the judge turned him down in this petition. In 2016, a five foot nine inch white male interviewed students at the University of Washington. And he would ask students on the sidewalk, what if I told you I was Chinese? What if I told you I was six foot five or a woman? Well, some students said, well, good for you. Others weren't so sure. Some were kind of awkward in responding. They didn't quite know how to handle these questions because it didn't seem obvious to them that he was a woman or you know, that it clearly was not six foot five and so forth. But yet there is this culture in which we live where you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, as Alan Bloom in the closing of the American Mind said that conflict is the evil we, wo we most want to avoid. And we certainly find ourselves in a world where feeling is the most dominant source of identity. How I feel is what I am. Of course, I could feel one way today and then feel differently next week, but that doesn't matter. Feelings are what ground my identity. As we're talking about truth, we're also needing to refer to the topic of relativism that a belief or an idea can be true for one person or culture and its opposite can be true for another. Like when in Rome, do as the Romans do. It's all a matter of cultural relativity. Who are you to say that someone else is wrong? Have you ever heard that? Of course, they believe that it's wrong to say that someone else is wrong. And it's not as though the Christian is saying, I'm the moral authority and you ought to listen to me. No, there's some basic moral realities that we need to come to terms with. So it's not as though I'm making this stuff up. Who made you the authority? Well, it's not up to me. Uh, I'm living, trying to live in conformity with a moral realm beyond ourselves. And usually when you talk to relativists, they talk in terms of my truth. They talk in terms of true for you, but not for me. But it really reduces down to something on the level of opinion. You have your opinion. I have my opinion. You have your perspective. I have mine. And so there's no such thing as truth. And if that's the case, what, what does lying even mean? After all, that's just your truth. I've got my truth. So there is no realm, there is no objective reality to which our truth claims conform anymore. Truth can be twisted in any way that one wants. 
And that's what C.S. Lewis said, and I point out in this book, a little book for new philosophers. He said that good philosophy must exist if for no other reason that bad philosophy must be answered. And there is a lot of bad philosophy that is going around in our day, and it's important for us to have a grasp on what these key ideas are. And so this is a bit of a rundown of where we're going to go in talking about truth, kind of breaking down what it means to talk about truth in a relativistic world. The first thing to keep in mind is that truth is a matchup with reality, which is unconstructed and inescapable. A lot of people see truth as a construct. You just make up your own truth you create your own reality. But when we talk about what truth is, truth is a matchup with the way things really are. If I say that something is true, if I say that, look, look, make the claim, the moon is made of cheese. Now, the reason that that's false is because my claim my, does not match up with the way things really are. The moon is not really made of cheese. It's a denial of the way things really are. Metaphysics is a study of reality, and a truth claim is an attempt to match up with the way things are. It's kind of like a, uh, a socket wrench that you put on the head of a, you put on a bolt and you adjust it, and when there is a good fit, you can turn it. There's a correspondence to the size of the, the socket wrench head and the head of that bolt that you can turn. So truth is this matchup with the way things really are. A, tr a statement or a story or a belief is true if it matches up with reality. Now, what do you say to people who claim that reality is just a construct? We just make up our own reality, and this is common in sociology classes, some philosophy classes, postmodernism is, is very much keen on this idea of our ideas, our beliefs, our claims of truth are simply a construct perhaps to oppress people, to use power against others and so forth. The problem with this, the idea that reality is a construct, is that the person who is saying this doesn't believe that his understanding of reality is a construct. This person believes that he is seeing things clearly, that he, his view is true and matches up with reality. Everyone else's is a construct. What, the problem with so many claims of people who are relativists or postmoderns, they will make claims that they seem to be exempt from, but everybody else is subject to. So they will say things like, that's just your perspective. Well, then if you only have just your own perspective, then why should I pay attention to it? But no doubt the person says that's just your perspective and he means you are wrong in holding your perspective. But that person doesn't want to say it because that would sound like that person believes that there is an objective realm of truth and reality to which our beliefs ought to conform. So the person who says that reality is like a wet lump of clay and that we can shape it any way we want to, believes that there's at least one thing that is not up to us to shape or construct, namely that reality is a wet lump of clay. Another claim that goes along with this is that reality is inaccessible to us. Uh, I teach a class at Palm Beach Atlantic University called the History of Philosophy, and we're talking about uh, certain philosophers like Immanuel Kant, who said that we can talk about things that appear to us. We can know things in terms of how they appear to us, but we can't talk about the way things really are. Now, the problem with this is, and I point out to my students, is that the philosopher Immanuel Kant seem to know something about this realm that we can't know anything about. He at least knows that we can't know anything about it. But how did he come to have that kind of an insight that seems to be cut off from the rest of, the rest of us? So, there is, so people who say we can't really have access, direct access to reality, that statement itself implies that that person has direct access to reality to tell us that we can't have access to reality, even though that person believes that he is saying something about the real world. So these are the sorts of problems that come with a relativistic postmodern mindset. People will make themselves the exception to their own rules. They will tell us some things that they believe they've been able to rise up above that everyone else has been, is, is subject to. 
When people talk about my truth or your truth, the thinking results ultimately in a kind of triviality or a contradiction. Think of that, I remember I was sitting on a plane talking with someone who was a sociologist, person was the editor of a magazine, and she was telling me about how everything is a matter of perspective. And that when you say something and I'm saying something, there is what's called this incommensurability, that we can't actually connect on things, that there's no commonality that we have. And I said, well, how do you know that? How do you know that there's no commonality between what we're talking about? It seems like we're having a perfectly coherent, intelligible conversation, which we understand each other. And she was saying, well, we just all have our own individual perspectives. I said, well, it seems that we have a kind of dilemma here. If you say that it's all a matter of perspective, is that just your perspective? Or is that true for everyone? You see, if it's just your perspective, why should I pay attention to it? But if you're saying that it's all a matter of perspective, well, then it's no longer just your perspective, but you're saying that this is something that is true about all people. So we're no longer dealing with just an opinion or a perspective, but we're dealing with truth for all people. So you have either something trivial that you're saying, or you're contradicting your something and contradicting yourself. And this is a common problem. Something is either trivial or it's self-contradictory. That is the problem of the relativist. That is the problem of the postmodern. It's sort of like this kind of the ice cream uh, flavor dilemma. The relativist has this kind of a dilemma. If it's a matter of, you know, we talk about enjoying different ice cream flavors. I mean, my favorite uh, before I became a carnivore uh, was a Ben and Jerry's New York Super Fudge Chunk. And I really enjoyed that ice cream, but it's not as though a person can't enjoy to great measure, say a Haagen-Dazs Swiss chocolate almond or something. But a lot of people treat the matter of truth as simply uh, that which is a preference. It's sort of like a buffet line. I'll pick a little bit of this, a little bit of that. What I like, I'll take. What I don't like, I'll reject. But if it is simply a matter of preference or opinion or perspective, we have that problem of the trivial versus the self-contradictory. If you say, well, this is just my favorite flavor, that's fine. But if you say everybody ought to like Ben and Jerry's New York Super Fudge Chunk, there's a problem. So it, no, it, it leaves from that realm of preference, of my own feelings, my own perspective, to now that which has to be universally embraced by all people, which becomes, therefore, self-contradictory. Don Cupid, uh, someone who is known, uh, you know, has been known for having a liberal theological view, uh, you know, very antagonistic toward the Christian faith, he says, reality has now become a mere bunch of disparate and changing interpretations. Now, is that just his own interpretation? Or is he speaking about the nature of reality? Friedrich Nietzsche said there are no facts only interpretations. Well, is that a fact or just an interpretation? And so we are right to follow the advice of Roger Scruton, a noted intellect, British intellectual who died a few years ago, uh, but a powerful writer. He said, a writer who says there are no truths or that all truth is merely relative is asking you not to believe him. So don't. This brings us to a question, why should we believe anything at all? Well, the reason we ought to believe something is because it's true, because it matches up with reality. And we as Christians hold that the Christian faith is true because God raised Jesus from the dead. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. We are believing in vain and we ought to be pitied above all people. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, let us just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Now, Paul didn't say, you know, the Christian faith gives to us purpose. The Christian faith gives to us community. The Christian faith gives to us a job to do in this world. And even if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it still gives us a purpose and community and so forth. Paul would say, nonsense. 
He said, that's pitiful, that's pathetic. We ought to get in tune with what reality is rather than living a deluded life. If Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins, Paul says. The historical resurrection of Jesus, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, is a clincher for the founda- as a foundation for the Christian faith. If there is no bodily resurrection, there is no Christian faith. I edited a book uh, a number of years ago called Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And it was a debate on the historical Jesus between the Jesus Seminar members, uh, people like John Domit Crossan and Marcus Borg and others, evangelicals like Craig Blomberg and William Lane Craig and so forth. And the, the chapter written by the Jesus Seminar, a very liberal group of scholars, uh, Marcus Borg, his chapter title in that book was The Irrelevancy of the Empty Tomb. Jesus rose from the dead, didn't rise from the dead, doesn't really matter. Jesus lives in our hearts, that's the main thing. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Well, if, that tomb, if Jesus' body rotted in the tomb, forget that song. <laughs> there is no hope. We are still in our sins. The truth matters. We ought to, why should we believe anything at all? Because it's true. And we ought to reject as many false beliefs as possible and to embrace as many true beliefs as possible. If truth is truth, it has to exclude something, namely error. And we have this problem in our country where, which encourages this kind of relativism because we, we don't want to say someone is wrong, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but this actually contributes to a weakening of our minds, it contributes to a weakening of our hold on reality. I don't want to hurt someone, I don't want to hurt the Muslim's feelings because he denies that Jesus died and rose again. I don't want to hurt that person's feelings. You no, know, we have a message to proclaim that involves those critical statements of faith, those critical beliefs, those things that happen in history. Uh, there is this book, you may have come across it, The Coddling of the American Mind, where there are three great untruths that these authors talk about. Uh, that found, that's found in you know, these beliefs or uh, untruths are uh, seen in many university students' minds and on campuses. Okay, these, un- these great untruths are what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. I thought it was what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But no, here it's it makes you weaker. Number two, always trust your feelings. Number three, and aren't we seeing more and more of this? Life is a battle between good people and evil people. And we have to be careful too. It's easy for us to say, oh, those are the evil people out there. And we often ignore the evil within our own hearts. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, that it's the line between good and evil is not between uh, political boundaries or nation states, you know, the lines that divide them, but it's actually the line that cuts through every human heart. And so it is important for us to recognize that. But in our culture, there is this safetyism that is so common on university campuses. And these authors uh, you know, talk about how this interferes with young people's social, emotional, and intellectual development and makes it harder for them to become autonomous adults who are able to navigate the bumpy road of life. Which is why free speech is often shut down because it actually requires people to think, to think about the truth to be challenged by the truth, and maybe challenged by the fact that my beliefs, maybe, aren't always true and need to be perhaps reinforced or tweaked or or rejected. So just depending upon what the topic is, but my wife and I were in Israel a a few years ago, back in 2019, and we heard an Arab reporter who was speaking to our group and a noted journalist who lived in Israel, and he said, you know, I agree probably with about 80% of the things that the Israeli government does, 20% I have problems with, but I'm glad to live in Israel. And he said that he used to go to, to university campuses in the United States, and he said he would get shouted down, he would be blocked, because he had a more moderate stance on Israel, he'd be blocked from being heard, and he said it became so terrifying that he just said, I'm, I'm no longer going to American university campuses because I'm just getting shouted down, I'm being vilified and so forth. He said, I would rather go to talk to people who belong to Hamas in the Palestinian territory 
than to go to uh, American university campuses and deal with what I've had to deal with. I saw this uh, poster that uh, was on the internet and it was uh, at Colorado State University, this, this, um, this board that says, if you or someone you know are affected by free, a spe free speech event on campus, call your parents and ask them to come and take you home. I love this. You're not ready for university yet. <laughs> when I first thought, I thought, oh no, not another capitulation, another denigration of free speech. Oh, finally, there's a little bit of sanity here. You're not ready. Again, that's, that's again, reflecting that problem of the coddling of the American mind, where we're seeing so many people who are capitulating to that safetyism and not being willing to have their own views challenged. In fact, at Yale Law School, a lot of people are rejecting, you know, they don't want students from Yale to come to work for them, graduates from the Yale Law School. Why? Because the Yale Law students are only hearing one side of the picture. They don't want to have any sort of principal debate that brings two opposing sides against each other. And so it's just basically this, you know, this kind of confirmation bias where you just hear your own perspective and there's no other viewpoint that is allowed to enter into the discussion. That's not how you train lawyers, my friends. When it comes to the matter of how we live our lives, this is where relativism falls down. You see, if a person's going to be a relativist, that person is going to have to be a selective relativist. A selective relativist. I like to tell the story about uh, J.P. Moreland, the noted Christian philosopher. Someone who is one of the most 50, he's he and William Lane Craig, two of my friends and mentors who have been top-notch philosophers as, in the Christian community. In fact, they're listed as the 50, in the 50 most influential living philosophers today. So William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland. And they've done a great work in defending the gospel uh, against many challenges in the contemporary philosophical world. But J.P. Moreland, he was working with a campus ministry, uh, Campus Crusade, now Crew, and he was at the University of Vermont. And he met a student who told him, whatever is true for you is true for you, whatever is true for me is true for me. We just shouldn't go around forcing our views on other people. Now notice what, the, what was done there. They like to slip in absolutes after they've told you that everything is relative. It doesn't matter what you do, just as long as you don't hurt anybody. It doesn't matter what you do, but it has to be between two consenting adults. So they can't be full-blown relativists. They have to be selective about their relativism. So anyway, J.P. Moreland said to the student, so, you know, you know based on engaging him in conversation, found out where the student's room was, went in the student's room, started to unplug his stereo system, remember what those things are? Started to unplug his stereo system and actually started to walk out of the room with it. The student said, hey, you can't do that. J.P. Moreland said, why not? He says, that's not fair, that's not right. He said, what? You're not going to force your review on me that's wrong to steal your stereo, are you? And he said, you know, when it comes to sexual morality or cheating on exams, you say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all relative. But when somebody violates your rights or steals your property, then you say, hey, you can't do that. Interestingly, a couple of weeks later, that student ended up giving his life to Christ because he recognized the connection between human rights and human dignity and the image of God being made by a loving creator rather than just being the, uh, the result of molecules in motion with no direction, with no value, and so forth. Which suggests, perhaps, maybe a new evangelistic method called stealing stereos for Jesus. <laughs> so, so perhaps that uh, is something we take up in, in, at a future conference. <clears throat> what we see in the relativistic pursuit is fundamentally a breakdown of everything that we take for granted, that makes our lives work, that enables us to function properly, that allows us to have relationships with each other. I was speaking at a conference in the Atlanta area, and a young man came up to me. I'd been speaking on relativism, and he said, the sorts of things that you were just talking about really typified my life. I was not someone who believed in truth. He said, I rejected the notion of objective truth. I found it oppressive and so forth. And I really liked this girl. 
And she, after a while, said, I can't be in a relationship with someone who is a relativist. How can I trust someone who is a relativist? How can I have a devoted, committed friendship, loving relationship with someone who's a relativist, who doesn't care about truth, doesn't care about commitment, doesn't care about keeping promises? So this, she left him, ended up really devastating him, and this led to a kind of quest for himself. He started to actually take truth seriously. Eventually, it led him to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he, he, and he told me, he said, so much has come together for me. My life was just a, a mess because it just didn't hold together because I wasn't committed to the truth. And he said, you see that lady sitting over there? That's my wife. And she actually saw the change in my life. And we ended up getting back together and we love serving Christ together now. So when you live a relativistic life, try to live it as, in a sense, consistently as possible, you find that it simply breaks down. You cannot live that way. Relativism means rejecting the need to guard one's conscience. People used to talk about the conscience as something that mattered so much that it was a matter of, you know, if, I, if, I, if I go against my conscience, I'm going to undermine my own integrity. I'm going to undermine my own identity. For the relativist, forget conscience, forget integrity. There's no big deal here. There is no moral law. And of course, this has implications for our own evangelism. If a person is a relativist, then that person is rejecting any kind of moral standard. And if that person rejects a moral standard, then this means that there is nothing to turn from and you know, to turn away from and to turn to. You know, you know, leaving those worthless idols, you know, abandoning them to serve the living God. Well, there is nothing to turn from. There is no moral standard, so there can't be repentance. There can't be salvation for the person who says, I'm a relativist. It is when that person recognizes that he has fallen short, when he's gone against the moral law, that he has defied it, then that there is hope for that person. It seems to me that the person who is a relativist isn't a relativist simply because of an intellectual pursuit. You know, I, fig I figured it all out, that relativism must be the case. It seems to be a lot more personal than that. People, you know, in, in order to get to the relativistic position, you've got to use logic. Logic means using objective laws that are part of the structure of reality, that we can't go against them. If we reject logic, we'll actually be using logic to do so. And the person who concludes relativism has been using the rules of logic to somehow get there and would therefore have to fundamentally deny relativism in the end if he's being consistent. So the person is not really doing this because it's a, an honest intellectual quest but rather because it's a matter of personal preference, perhaps. Or perhaps that relativist really hasn't found a secure person to trust in his or her life. Maybe there hasn't been that trustworthy authority. That person has been burned so many times and so just gives up on trusting others, gives up on trusting that there is such a thing as objective truth. Perhaps there's even pain involved in that. Let me say something briefly about uh, some confusions that relativists make and sometimes Christians can also make. And it's a matter of tolerance and judging. I just want to say a few things here about those particular topics. In class classical understanding, tolerance meant you put up with what you take to be disagreeable or false. You put up with what you take to be disagreeable or false. Tolerance isn't something that you celebrate, that you rejoice over. Tolerance is something you put up with. Maybe somebody's bad breath or you know, maybe somebody's snoring on the plane next to you. You, you. you put up with those things. You bear with it. Tolerance is different from celebration or even acceptance. Tolerance has negativity built into it. But our modern understanding of tolerance means to accept everything, to celebrate everything, to embrace everything as true and good. 
The problem with this viewpoint of accepting all beliefs as true is that the, the relativist isn't going to believe or accept the belief of the absolutist. The relativist is going to reject anybody who says this is true for all people, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life for everyone. So the relativist is going to be selective. He's going to only embrace those beliefs that are relativistic, but isn't going to accept the, the view of the person who holds to moral absolutes or theological absolutes like Jesus being the atoning sacrifice for the sins of humanity. So again, we have this twisted understanding of tolerance. And so it's going to be an inconsistent one if you simply say accepting all views is true. If I accept the Christian faith and if I accept the Buddhist's faith, then I'm embracing a contradiction because the Buddhist doesn't believe in God and the Christian does. So I can't say, yes, I believe in God and don't believe in God at the same time. Again, it, it, it's one of those things you simply cannot live with. You're, you have to pick and choose. What about the problem of judging? A lot of people will say, who are you to judge? Someone else. Ever been accused of that? Now be careful about, of course, we have to be careful about the tone that we have when we're talking to people might have a little bit of an edge to it. We might be perhaps quick to jump to conclusions and, and we have to be careful there, of course. But when we talk about judgment, a lot of relativists who don't have anything to do with the Bible or believing in Jesus, they will like to quote Jesus on Matthew 7, 1. Don't judge lest you also be judged. So they will talk about uh, you know, this kind of a uh, an embrace of Jesus when it seems to support their relativistic beliefs. The problem here is, is that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't, see, a lot of people think don't judge means don't say that there's anything that's wrong. Jesus wasn't saying that. Just a few verses later, he says, don't cast your pearls before swine or give what is holy to the dogs. There is some sort of a moral indictment here that Jesus is making. The point that Jesus was making was first check yourself before you try to correct the problem in someone else. If you got a, you know, if there is a speck in someone's eye, is that a problem? Of course it is. It's very uncomfortable. People are starting to rub their eyes here. Uh, you know, you know the, 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 it's, it's uncomfortable to have a speck in your eye, but Jesus says first take the log out of your own eye. And then you can take the speck out of your brother's eye. There's a problem that needs to be addressed, but first check yourself, examine yourself. Don't rush to judgment. First, do some self-scrutinizing. But interestingly, Jesus in John 7, 24 says, don't judge by mere appearances, but make a right judgment. John 7, 24, make a right judgment. The same word that's used in Matthew chapter 7. So judgment is not, you can't say that, you know, someone else is wrong. Jesus is saying a lot of people are wrong quite a bit of the time. Read Matthew 23 where he's excoriating the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Woe to you. He is condemning them verse after verse. What Jesus is saying though is you know, again, not having that sense of moral superiority. That's what Jesus is speaking against. That sense of moral superiority, perhaps at the failure of someone else. First, examine yourself, but make a right judgment. Moral relativism, as it turns out, is simply a system of absolutes. Even though people talk about your truth, your morality, and so forth, we simply cannot escape morality even if you're a relativist. So here are some absolutes that relativists hold to. If you're not a relativist, you're absolutely mistaken. Uh, you should never say that someone else is wrong. Of course, the relativist can say that those who disagree with her are wrong. It's absolutely true that all views are equally acceptable and not to accept someone else's view is immoral. Well, of course, that person is not going to accept your view as a Christian because that your view is intolerant and so forth. But again, there are these exceptions that the relativist has. The relativist says it's wrong to impose your morality on others. But where does that standard of morality come from? Why is it morally wrong? Seems like there's this objective standard. 
You should always be tolerant. Tolerance is the supreme virtue for the relativist. But why ought I be tolerant? It's just tolerant when it comes to certain beliefs. But when it comes to the relativist, the relativist doesn't want to have his own viewpoint critiqued. It's only those who hold to absolutes that can be critiqued. You should never judge. There's another wrong. Uh, you ought to be open-minded. There's another uh, moral mandate. It's wrong to be, you know, you know it's, or it's arrogant and bigoted and imperialistic to be ethnocentric. So we see these kinds of moral standards that even the relativists themselves hold to. I was speaking at the State University of New York in Oswego a number of years ago, and there was a young lady during the Q&A time, she was saying, she was accusing me of my views being ethnocentric. And I said, well, it, it seems to me that you do believe that ethnocentrism is wrong for all people. I said, but why do you think that I am being ethnocentric? And she said, you believe that your viewpoint ought to be imposed on other people. I said, well, I'm not trying to impose my view. I'm trying to expose people to a certain viewpoint and hope that they will be persuaded to accept it. But when it comes to imposing, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, if you're walking down a dark alley and there is a person who is about to assault you, but there's also a stranger who would be willing to help you and intervene. Would you want that stranger to impose his morality on your attacker? She said, you're distorting what I'm saying. I said, no, I'm not distorting what you're saying. I'm saying that it's easy for us to talk about relativism when it's kind of out there and not affecting me. That's just true for you or right for you, but not for me. But when somebody violates my rights, when somebody violates me, I know that that is wrong. So moral, moral relativism has to be selective. Uh, you know, when people are, when people are reading the, you know, the sports page, when people are reading a prescription bottle, they're not going to be relativists about that. They're not going to say, oh, that's just true for the pharmacist, but not for me. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to say, well, you know, you know, you know, Brazil lost the World Cup for you, but not for me, you know, a few years ago. Um, you, know, we, you know, we don't operate that, be, that way. When it comes to God and morality, that's where people start to get relativistic. They don't get relativistic when it comes to, oh, you say that light was green, I say it was red, officer, or vice versa. You know, we don't do that. We recognize that there are certain things where we, that don't cut to the heart of who we are, that don't cut to the heart of our own personhood, our own moral decision-making, our own desire for autonomy and so forth. When it cuts to those deeper things, that's when we're more likely to be relativistic than just kind of your every ordinary, everyday ordinary sorts of things like sports scores and so on. When it comes to morality, if, you know, some people say, well, prove to me that there is such a thing as objective morality. Well, there is simply a common sense view in the, in the Christian philosopher Thomas Reed, who was a contemporary of David Hume in the 18th century in Scotland. He said, if a person doesn't get that there really are some wrong things, like torturing babies for fun, if a person can't see those things, then no amount of logic is going to persuade that person. He said that person really just needs to get medical or psychiatric help. You cannot talk with a person logically who simply rejects basic objective moral values. And I think we'd really kind of call a person's bluff when the person says, you know, when we say, do you really believe that it's okay to torture babies for fun? Well, I don't like it, but other, for other people it might be okay. I said, no, I, I want to know about you. Do you believe that it's wrong? Would you try to stop someone who is doing that because you believed it was wrong? Of, of course you would. And, and, and I, I don't believe you if you're saying, oh, that's morally neutral. I just don't believe you. I think you're bluffing. Of course, if there is a moral standard that exists, that means we have to live our lives in conformity to it. And that is, of course, a big point of resistance. But morality is properly basic. Can we get some things wrong? Sure we can. But if you read at the end of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great, uh, on the, uh, the Abolition of Man, there's a whole catalog of these various moral codes from across civilizations throughout the world 
that sounds strangely similar. It sounds like Romans chapters 1 and 2, uh, the people recognizing, you know, these moral standards that exist. We don't have to have a Bible to recognize those things. People in general can recognize those very things. Also, if you get rid of morality, you have to basically deal with a reformer's dilemma. Wasn't it a good thing to get rid of slavery? Wasn't it a good thing to abolish apartheid? You know, aren't these moral gains? Of course they are. If you say, oh, that's morally neutral, it doesn't really matter. No, of course, there, there's something wrong with that way of thinking. Also, human dignity and worth fundamentally undermine relativism. A lot of relativists will say, I've got my rights, or I have a right to do... There are no rights if you're a relativist. That's just right for you. But ultimately, there are no rights. If you believe that there is such a thing as human rights, then you can't be a relativist. Just a couple final words, we're just out of time here. When we're speaking with people who are relativistic, maybe a few things might help. First of all, distinguishing between the person and the belief. The relativist says, if you say that I'm wrong, that means you don't accept me. Again, that's a faulty uh, you know, collapsing or a conflation. We can say, I, 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 uh, you know, I can respect you as a person, even though I disagree with your viewpoint. And I think that that's what makes for, say, strong friendships. We can be friends even though we disagree with each other. That's a good thing. We can also differentiate between the attitude and the person. Sometimes we come down hard on someone, but we need to differentiate between attitude and person. A soft answer turns away wrath. Sometimes people who are believe in truth can be very forceful and can turn off people. So we need to differentiate there as well. But in the end, truth should be what imposes rather than persons imposing their views on others. We ought to seek to persuade people about what we take to be true if they are willing to listen. As we come together, as we talk about truth, we also need to remember, as we saw earlier, that at the, at the heart of what we are proclaiming is the gospel that is true, not just for us, but it is true for all people. It is good news to be shared with those with whom we come into contact. And so it is imperative for us to hold to the truth and also to hold to that proclamation of the truth that people may come out of the kingdom of darkness and into God's marvelous light. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for these reminders about the matter of truth, about the importance of living in light of that truth, which means also being bold in proclaiming that good news, being wise, being winsome, being gracious, being loving, uh, but also not shrinking from the opportunity to make known your goodness, and to, to let our light shine brightly before others so that they might see our good works and glorify you, our Father in heaven. So give us grace, we pray, Lord, as we navigate uh, as being bearers of truth in a relativistic world. And we pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen.